Today we're going to be taking a virtual tour of the Bolton Point Water Treatment Plant, which services a fairly large area at the south end of Cayuga Lake. Populated areas have as one of their attributes a fairly large resource footprint, one that extends far beyond their own geographic boundaries. In the case of the Bolton Point Treatment Plant, it withdraws water from Cayuga Lake. Cayuga Lake has a watershed or a basin that is perhaps ten times larger than the extent of the lake itself. Within this watershed, it's split into subwatersheds or catchments, and what you see here is the Six Mile Creek watershed highlighted. This services the city of Ithaca, and off to the east, off to the right in your field of view, is the Fall Creek watershed, and this is what services the Cornell water supply. Uh, the area of these watersheds is not necessarily proportional to the size of the population that they're servicing, but it just gives you some idea of how the Cayuga Lake Basin is subdivided into different drainage areas. Our tour guide today is Joan Foote, who's the production manager here at Bolton Point. Um, how are you this afternoon, Joan? Very good. How are you? Good. Good. How long has the Bolton Point treatment plant been here? We've been online since 1976. Um, this area is very fortunate to have actually three water plants. There's one at Cornell, there's one at the city of Ithaca that feeds the city, and we feed the five municipalities around the city. Those include the town of Ithaca, the town and village of Lansing, the village of Cuga Heights, and the town of Dryden. So we basically supply water all the way from AES, all the way around the lake, cutting out the city in Cornell, and all the way up to Jacksonville on the other side of the lake. We're easily 50 feet above the datum of the lake here. Where do we get, where does the plant get its water and how does it get into the plant? We have a raw water pump station that's at about a quarter of a mile up the road. Um, at that pump station is the intake. It's a 36 inch diameter pipe that goes out 400 feet and it pumps the water up here to the plant. Um, at that intake, we also treat with chlorine dioxide, which is a liquid form of chlorine. We do that to control the zebra mussels. And you add anything else, or is that all you really need because our lake is so clean? Um, our lake is actually very clean. The water comes in around one um, NTU, which is a measurement of turbidity, and typically it leaves the plant at 0.04 NTU, wow. so we take um, the vast majority of that turbidity out. These are sample taps up here in the lab, and they are coming from different areas in the process of the treatment plant. Uh, we have them running all the time so that I can come up here and grab a sample and know immediately what's happening. This is the raw water that I'm taking a sample of in order to take a turbidity test. Uh, turbidity is basically a measurement of how much suspended solids are in the water. Um, the layman's term for that might be how much cloudiness there is in the water. Turbidity meters basically work by shining a light through the sample and it measures how light bounces off the particles. You see the turbidity is about 0.71 for the raw water. So I'm still not quite sure I get the deal with, with turbidity and cloudiness. We drink things that are turbid all the time, like cider and orange juice. Um, so why are we concerned about turbidity per se? We want to remove as many of the suspended particles in the water because that allows our chlorine to react with everything. Um, pathogens, germs, viruses can all hide inside that turbidity or those solids that are floating around in there and we want to let our chlorine interact to the best advantage there. So we want to remove as much turbidity as possible. So once the water is pumped up here to the water plant, the first chemical that we add is the coagulants. Um, there's two types of coagulants that we add. One is called polymer and one is called aluminum sulfate. And aluminum sulfate, I assume, is soluble? Yes. So it, it dissociates and you get a positively charged 
molecule or a positively charged atom and a negatively charged molecule. Correct. Right, and right. then that attracts reciprocally either positive stuff attracts negative stuff, negative stuff attracts positive stuff, Correct. and that just keeps on going as kind of a chain reaction Correct. to give you this, this flock, these long chains. What's the polymer? Is that like a, a little bead? A little no, that's the bead same same sort of form. Um, okay. People use many different forms of coagulates. Some people use uh, PAC, which is alum and polymers put together. We each happen okay. to use a polymer and an alum, both liquid forms. Okay. The alum we set at a, a set dosage of 5 milligrams per liter, and the polymer is what we measure. We keep track of the ionic charge and make sure it stays as close to zero as possible so our particles don't start repelling each other, and we adjust that up and down as our turbidity goes up and down. So the polymer is not a an ion exchange resin bead or anything like that. It's no, actually no, a, yes, it, there, it's, it's a molecule. Yes, and it's water soluble, and that's how we actually apply all our chemicals. Um, we get huge day tanks full of them, of course, and we dissolve them in water, and then we eject that into the um, raw water line, and that's how we dissolve all our chemicals. The second type of chemical that we add are um, pH adjusters. The water coming in out of the lake is about 7.7 .7 pH. Um, by the time we add the different coagulants, that drops down some, so then we raise enough sodium hydroxide to adjust the pH up to 8.3, and that's to make the water not corrosive. Um, otherwise, if the water leaves the plant and it's too corrosive, it will leach lead out of people's homes that have either lead lines or lead solder. Um, then the water goes through a mixer, which mixes all the water together so the coagulates are everywhere. And then it goes through our flocculation basin. Um, this is a huge basin with large boards that is gently mixing the water as the boards spin around. And the idea is to form flock. Um, the particles that are in the raw water itself are so tiny and so dispersed that they really, you really can't see anything. So the coagulants start to attract all those particles together by positive and negative charges, and then you have flock, which are tiny white specks that you can actually see in the water. There's something that have mass so that we can either settle them out or filter them out. Well, that's interesting. So this whole process we, we could call flocculation, Correct. is that right? Correct. And then flock actually is a bunch of particles that are uh, bigger than microscopic, but they're still right. pretty tiny, and they, they can just glom onto each other. That's right. right. They all uh, start to stick together and form large sticky chains, particles that then have mass and we can settle out. After the water goes through the flocculation basins, it goes into a sedimentation basin. Um, these are basins that are also very deep. They're about 11 feet deep. Um, they have a row of tube settlers in them which allow the particles to accumulate mass and they only have to settle so far down. They accumulate more mass and they slip down the tube settlers. The idea here is to settle out as much of the flock as possible so that we don't have short filter runs by clogging up our filters and letting too much of that oh, go out. Okay. So at the bottom of these sedimentation basins are large boards. They're on a chain drive and they literally scrape all the sediment that settles out. Um, into simple basins that are cone-shaped with foot valves that we open up and then drain that flock out. At that point, we call it sludge. It huh. is stored in the back of our plant in um, lagoons where we dry it out and then we can bulldoze that out and take that um, to our sludge pile. Do you get a lot of it? We don't. That's um, one advantage wow. that we have over the city in Cornell. Because we pump out of the lake, the lake itself acts as a huge settling basin. So we don't see a lot of turbidity come into the plant. Um, Cornell and the city pump out of cricks, so they do. Um, if you imagine after a large rainfall, it's uh, very, very turbid, looks like chocolate milk. They have to settle all of that out and deal with all that sediment. Um, we, don't, we rarely see that. For our turbidities are typically one NTU, whereas something at the crick after a rainfall would be 300, 400 NTU. So we don't generate as much sludge as the city or Cornell would pumping out of creeks. This stuff isn't really toxic or is it toxic? Um, well it does have, um, we use aluminum sulfate and polymers to absorb, okay. to attract all that so it does have aluminum sulfate in it. We do actually have a um, 
contract through the DEC. It's called a BUD beneficial use um, program, mm -hmm. and we could use that, mix that. You, you mix that with potting soil, and you can use it for non-agricultural uses. But we've never really generated enough here at the plant oh, to really? interest anybody to come uh -huh. and get it. So after all this stuff settles out, can, can I drink it or do you do something else to it? You no, know, we continue to treat it. Um, the s particles are all settled out at the bottom of the sedimentation basin and we collect the cleaner water off the top. We call those weirs, basically look like, look like troughs, and that carries the water to the top of our filter. There are many types of filters. We have something called a mixed media filters. There are also um, membrane filters or um, slow sand filters, but ours are mixed media. This is a core sample of what our filters look like. These are actually very large filters. They're around 13 feet square, but uh, this is just a core sample of what it shows, uh, what it looks like. The idea here is that we have three basic layers of media. This is the layer of support gravel, basically large rocks to keep the media from falling through the filter. This is the layer of garnet has um, heavier, larger particles all the way down to up to finer particles. These are very dense and very small size particles. This is a layer of sand, which is a medium weight and a medium size. And this top layer is a layer of anthracite coal, which is very large and very light. Okay, so we've pumped it into the plant, we've added some chlorine, we've added these coagulants, we have let it, some of that stuff settle out, we've filtered it. Now where does it go? We add a few more chemicals after it runs through our filters. This is where we add the sodium hydroxide to raise the pH okay. up at 8.3. And this is also where we add the gaseous chlorine. Um, in the beginning of the process, we've added the uh, chlorine dioxide, and that was really just to start the oxidation process, but most of that chlorine is then gone by the time it gets through our plant. And now we add gaseous chlorine um, to a dosage of 1.4 milligrams per liter. That's what it leaves, needs to leave the plant so that all the different residences are protected. Once we add the pH adjuster and the last chlorine, it goes into what we call a clear well. It's a tank um, underneath the floor of our pump gallery at the end of the plant, the treatment process. It holds a quarter of a million gallons. That's where we have finished water pumps that then pump the water out into our distribution system. Um, the way our system works is we have three main reservoirs um, that hold close to 5.9, um, I believe it is, million gallons. And those are our reservoirs that are filling when the plant is on and emptying when our plant is off. From there, we have a variety of tanks and pump stations that um, pump water up into elevations, and that's where all our customers are fed off of those tanks. And they're fed off of those tanks at a high elevation so that there's a fairly constant head, a hydraulic yes, head that yes. will provide instantaneous pressure on demand. That's right. It's all fed by gravity to the houses, so we have to have the tanks high enough that they have the adequate pressure at their sure. houses. So here we are on top of Burdick Hill at a high point in our service area. As we zoom out just a little bit, you can see that we increase the number of users, the number of residences, by a factor that is substantially more than just a, a linear kind of projection. The number of residences is going up as some kind of exponential function of the area served. This is just with residences. As we go out even further, we see that we start to include industrial services, industrial processes as well. So one of the properties of cities, as we know, is that they tend to scale along exponential axes. And even in the relatively suburban and open space area around Ithaca, we see this same kind of phenomenon. Ask the question, which is more feasible for every user in this service area to collect and process its own water, or to combine resources and use 
a facility like Bolton Point to give us this water. Think of how much surface area would be required if every house had its own reservoir to say supply a family of four with sufficient water over a 10-day rainless period. We're talking about quite a bit of area. So again, we get back to this area limitation kind of thing and the fact that cities have resource footprints that are far beyond their geographic extent. To summarize what we've seen today, the first step is intake and pretreatment with a chlorine compound to discourage the growth of zebra mussels. The second step is adding chemicals or flocculants to remove particulate matter from the water. The third step is mixing of the chemicals with the water so that we get a thorough mixing. Next comes flocculation where the particles and the chemicals form larger particles Following the formation of these larger particles, they're allowed to settle out of the water column where they can be removed. The next step in the process is filtration, which is a physical process whereby the particles, the flocculated particles, are removed. Following filtration, chlorine gas is added to the mix here to disinfect to remove pathogens and any microbes that might be in the, in the water column. It's then stored temporarily right inside the plant in what's called a clear water well. After disinfection, the water is pumped uphill to large water tanks or storage reservoirs. And finally, the water is distributed from these tanks to the individual users throughout the service area.